days a week. I had to condition my hair before I'd go in. I had to wash it when I come out and condition it again, trying to figure out a system to make it easy to maintain my hair. I just became obsessed with hair care from an early age, like eight years, I was washing my hair every day, you know, first like every day of the week. So, um, which is interesting because you mentioned like the organic side of things as being somewhat extreme, right? Of an experience that you had in your family. But then on top of that, swimming is also a very extreme experience to go through in terms of the, you know, chlorine and what it does to your hair on Absolutely. top of all of that. It's an extreme sport for your body and it's an extreme sport for textured hair. Mm -hmm. So then um, graduating high school, I went to Howard University, shout out to HU, um, where I think just coming on Howard's campus and being a part of a majority for the first time in my life was life changing for me. And I think it really, without even having to realize it, just internally and intrinsically, I realized like my issue wasn't me, it's the industry. So the hair care industry for far too long, especially when it comes to textured hair, hasn't really centered around the consumer. The, it, what it's been centered around is these norms that are kind of these unfounded quote unquote norms or, 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 you know, kind of lived as truths that are untruths that, you know, we don't want clean product. Well, yes, we do want clean product, but it has to perform. It can't break our hair or make it feel brittle. It has to be sustainable. It has to, um, it has to perform above all else. Our hair care has to perform. And I think, um, you know, now as a founder of Sienna Naturals, I come to understand that so much just in conversation, not only my personal journey, but understanding my consumer and my customer's journey where, you know, I have customers who are super busy moms and they work as, you know, in a corporate job five days a week. So they might get their hair blown out and wear it straight or wear a protective style or weaves, wigs or extensions in the workplace. But then they want to have that flexibility on Friday to go home and wear their hair naturally so that they're embracing their texture and showing their children that they're embracing their natural texture, right? So I think it's about like enabling the versatility of our hair because, and I think this is why the Crown Act is so important, right? 80% of black women in the US believe, you know, feel the need to alter their hair from its natural state in order to succeed in the workplace, right? So that's like, that's a huge mm -hmm. number. Um, and so, you know, I think like if you look at the hair care industry, it has, it has been, can, it has been, I guess the product offering really reflects that need where mm -hmm. it reflects the need of a woman who has all this social pressure to alter her hair from its natural state and kind of put the end result and the final style above all else. Well, I want to talk about that too, just in the context of sort of the intersection of this legislation, which is very important. And might I add, it only passed in California two years ago, right? right. The Crown Coalition is dedicated to passing that same legislation nationwide. And California was the first, I think that there's maybe five other states, but that means in every other state, it is legal to discriminate against workers for their hairstyles, right? I mean, that's wild. And right. at the same time, as you just said, I mean, we've just seen this incredible, and I'm curious, you know, what your perspective is on this being right in the middle of it. But I would say over the last, you know, five, five, yeah, three to five to 10 years, like we're seeing progress also with, you know, black women founded companies who are able to create, you know, products for, you know, your own community, right, and are actually being able to break into the market and create things from personal experience that previously were not available, right, that um, respond not only to your personal needs, but also um, in doing so allow you to, you know, feel liberation, not only in your own bathroom and as you're taking care of your own hair, right, um, but, it, or in your own home, but in the workplace. And, uh, you know, the Crown Act, again, just to, to be clear, it's, it's, it's a low bar, right, when we're just talking about not discriminating against people, right? And this is why we wanted to come together, Sienna Naturals and Phenomenal, around this campaign, which is let's, you know, continue to advocate for the passage of legislation, but let's also acknowledge that it's not just about, like, tolerating natural hair, right, or just, or just um, seeking anti-discrimination, and it's really about encouraging Black women to reclaim our hair story, to celebrate, you know, your crowns, to really shift culture and dialogue, right? And we know that uh, legislation is only so um, good if you have, you know, the ability to shift culture. That is, you know, it's not possible to see change without that. So we have to do both of those things. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in the context of your um, launching, you know, CNN Naturals, I think more than five years ago, right? I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. What progress have you seen, not only in the product space, but, you know, in the context of freedom and uh, being able to show up as your authentic self in the workplace as well, and, and what the Crown Act is really geared towards? Absolutely. Well, yes. And I just want to give a shout out to you, Mina, because um, I love what you're doing with Phenomenal to take these social, uh, these, these difficult social truths and help raise awareness about them through Phenomenal and your own social channel. Sorry, my dog is coughing. Um, but also <laughs> to, because I think that's the crux of it. Like, I think the, the legislation is the beginning because it acknowledges that there's a problem, right? And real research, implicit bias right. went into that research to prove that it exists. So you acknowledge that, but then how do you actually turn it into something where we're celebrating our hair? Where it's not just about like acknowledging the pain. It's, it's like understanding this painful truth and then actually figuring out how to celebrate our hair as it grows out of our head and make that a bona fide reality for not only black women, but you know, our children, our, our community for everybody so that we can you know, learn to celebrate. And I, mm -hmm. I will say I have seen a lot of progress. Um, and I think you know, I think part of reclaiming your hair story, at least for me personally, is like looking back and acknowledging like, okay, I did a lot of things to try and conform to, and, and, and in a way, like when I started relaxing my hair at the age of 12, also still while swimming, right, the whole time looking like Gollum coming out of the pool, <laughs> um, you know, like my hair was stringy, it was not healthy, oh, but man, I was like, yeah. that, that, I, I acknowledged I was doing that, um, to try and fit in or be accepted but in a way i was like i was you know i guess accepting this uh idea that my hair was somehow not beautiful on its own mm -hmm. and so it's like okay i know my hair is beautiful on its own and i want to rock it the best way i can i want to make it as healthy as it can be so that it looks its best mm -hmm. um, but then i think a part of reclaiming is also saying well you know what when i was working in corporate america and i wore my hair straight so that it wouldn't be the topic of conversation in a meeting where i really wanted my work product to stand out um i kind of like it look when it's straight i like that look a little bit or mm -hmm. i might want to add a piece or or put braids in and extensions i think like part of reclaiming our hair story is also celebrating the versatility mm -hmm. and the beauty and the creativity of our right. style and I, so I really, I say all that and I, I think a big part and a big tenet of my brand for Sienna Naturals is enabling my, consumer, my customer to reclaim their hair story so that um, they can have the freedom to express themselves how they feel most beautiful and authentic. And so, um, so I think that's really important to mm -hmm. acknowledge that it doesn't mean you have to wear your hair in its naturally curly state all the time. My goal is so that, my goal is to make you feel beautiful and empowered and you know, and, and I'm doing that because you're going to be able to feel like this product was made for you in the shower and it's going to help restore the health of your hair and scalp. But mm -hmm. I think like that, that to me is the progress I'm seeing is, you know, I think the natural hair movement, it, while it was, it's important to wear your hair in its natural state and to teach that to our children. I think that um, it's also important that we retain the freedom to express ourselves however we want, because I think you know, what I would not want to do is try and tell someone how they need to wear their hair in order to have access to freedom or something like that. You know, to me, that, right. that, that doesn't, that doesn't resonate. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, I, we had a really great, um, conversation about this when we were discussing this collaboration and I, that's exactly right. I think it is, you know, it's pretty basic. It's allowing people to do whatever the hell they want, whether that is wearing your hair straight or wearing a wig or wearing a weave or literally just doing whatever the hell you want being able to live your life go to work and my god not being discriminated against for it it's pretty basic right just be able to uh have respect and freedom and and that is the point that legislation you know is uh the the least that we can do to just protect against racism and sexism in the workplace and really yeah now we're looking towards you know again this idea of, of culture shift and dialogue right and, and changing the narrative which is about yes. true respect and freedom and i love what you said the, about um earlier that you know this is not just for black women this is for everyone to be a part of um understanding of celebrating of respecting right and um engaging with this in a way that we know again helps to shift that you know culture so that 
not only in the workplace, but in our day-to-day lives, right? People can experience um, just a, a, a positive, right, uplifting uh, experience of, of, of dealing with their hair. Or I shouldn't even say dealing with your hair, but in your own, <laughs> doing what you want with your hair, right, in the most basic yes. way. Um, yes. I also, I, I want to add, I mean, we've connected also over being mothers, and you mentioned, right, um, children and how you're uh, raising the next generation. And I'm curious, you know, you've been doing this for a long time now, and you've had such a personal experience growing up with your own hair journey um, in your own family. But how, how do you think about this now as a mom? And has that perspective shifted at all in your own home? Or have you, have you sort of changed how you think about or talk about uh, hair and, and hair care and, 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 you know, self-love and all of that. I, I'm curious, just the motherly uh, perspective on all of this, because I know for me, it's been a huge um, change in perspective around all of these issues. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, you know, when my two-year-old came home from preschool and said she wanted her hair to be straight, I just, it was a wake-up call because I didn't, I wasn't aware that this was still impacting children, you know, in my children's generation. And so um, what I've done is, and I think this is important. It's another part of like, I think celebrating crown day, what we should all do is let's take a look at our vocabulary that we use with our kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, I started to very intentionally talk to my daughter about our hair and create vocabulary that we use, create boundaries for other people with regard to whether they can touch it or not. And so Mm -hmm. one thing, you know, she, we like this, what I have on my head, we don't call this a ponytail. We don't have ponytails, ponytails, ponytails are straight and long, right? Mm. Our natural hair isn't a ponytail. It's a puff. Mm -hmm. So we talk about our hair being a puff. So what do you want today? I want two puffs. I want braids. She doesn't, she's eliminated the word ponytail from her vocabulary. Mm. I'm really proud of that. I'm like really learning here because we say puff also, but I didn't, and I'm so intentional with language, as you know, like that's a big thing with my kids' books and right how, especially how yes. we talk to women and girls. That yes. is so, I mean, brilliant, right? It's also like, right, a ponytail is literally a reference to a horse's tail, right? Which is long, straight hair. And wow, so I now, as of this conversation, will also be much more intentionally eliminating ponytail from our conversation. But Yes. That is, um, that is really smart. Okay, tell me more. I, I need to take yeah. some notes here. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I think another thing that I, I noticed with my daughter was, and even my son too, like people just coming up and touching their hair. And mm-hmm. I think like, to me, it speaks, there's this history of, you know, a white person being able to put their hands on a black child where it wouldn't work the other way around. Like, me going into preschool and touching like the straight blonde kids hair of the other mom, that is not something that I would ever feel comfortable doing Mm -hmm. or even it wouldn't even cross my mind. So when people are sort of fascinated by their hair or think it's really beautiful and want to go to touch, we say, no, thank you. Or not today. Um, There's a brilliant book called don't touch my hair. Yeah. We Um, have have that book. You have that book, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think, let me, On that, sorry, just to interject quickly that on this topic of this being a conversation for everyone to be a part of, what I think about in the context of not touching hair, and we have that exact same conversation, we have the same book, it's really about boundaries, right? As you said, that's not something that you would do with white children, but it's something that in our culture that, or or is something that people are just accustomed to doing that is not acceptable, um, that it's really about personal space. And to that point, and God, I love this ponytail thing, but it's about, (laughs) uh, you know, contextualizing it in the same way, which is that if, if my own daughter went up to, you know, my own kids went up to another child and did that, I'd say, Hey, did you ask permission? Right. Did you, um, you know, I mean, this is truly an issue of like consent, right. I, uh, did you, did you get their um, permission to, you know, touch their hair or their arm or their clothes and really frame it as personal space. Right. I think it's important to have a specific conversation about black hair, knowing that that is a particular experience that, um, happens, but it's also, I think, important to understand that, you know, this isn't a, a special thing that only applies to us, right? It is a, a general, you know, um, way in which we can just raise good people who respect boundaries exactly. and other people's personal space. Yes, exactly. The other morning, my daughter woke up and they were like making up guitar songs. She made up a song about how her hair looks like cotton candy. And like, I was just like, oh my, oh my God, God. what a that. beautiful, positive association 
to have this treat, you know, like, so it was like, okay, I think, I think it's starting okay, to Hannah, work. I'm going to now encourage you to write a kid's book about hair that's like cotton candy. Can you just imagine like the illustrations? Oh my okay. God. Okay. Right. I, okay. I have to hit you up about that yeah. because you know what? Right. Maybe, maybe <laughs> there's, there's something there. that was just sparked here. Right. I love <laughs> it. Oh man. That's awesome. Okay. Tell me more. I I'm getting lots of tips from you about um, how we talk to our kids about this. Well, yes. And I think too, you know, um, I will have to say like, I'm so hyper aware of it because my kids have darker skin tones than me. And mm -hmm. I have, you know, my mom was white and my dad is black and I have a, a different black American experience than they're going to have. Mm -hmm. And I always, and, and this, is, this comes up a lot for me with um, my work too, because um, my hair care brand is really focused and the majority of our customers are women with the tighter textures and coils. Um, and I think that this conversation around identity is, yeah. it just seems to fall hand in hand with our hair. And my hair is pretty, is pretty highly textured. We all have multiple textures going on. I have like some very, uh, very tight coils and mm -hmm. my hair tends to be more fragile. I have like medium to fine hair that especially near the crown is, is tighter coils. And so, um, it's just, I always want to acknowledge like the role that identity plays in this because my kids ask me a lot about it. Like how, like mommy, um, cause I, I'm like my daughter, I think she, she and I look a lot of like, she saw one of my preschool pictures and was like, is that me? And I was like, yeah, yeah. that's me. <laughs> and, um, and so I think, you know, it, it's just, I think it's important to to talk to them about identity too. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, mommy identifies as black. I'm a very fair skinned black woman, but, mm -hmm. and it just, it, you, I think like, I guess because, because the Crown Act exists because race has always gone hand in hand with discrimination against our hair, right? Yep, so yep. I think that when I'm teaching hair empowerment, I also talk about identity with them as well and mm -hmm. how, um, and so, and I, and I think, you know, with my, with my core customer, um, it's always been something I've been aware of and like Issa coming on board and wanting to be a part of it because she also loved the product and she uses them, you know, our right. campus is a, a woman who's um, Nigerian descent and she uses, we, she's a mom as well. So we're both using these products on our hair on our children and on ourselves and having these conversations. Um, and so I think, you know, it's just another aspect about hair empowerment that I think is important to have is this, this conversation on identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really relate to that. I've had a um, similar experience with my own kids. And you mentioned also that your daughter uh, at the age of two, you know, expressed a preference for straight hair. And I had a very similar experience. I think she was a little bit younger and it happened much earlier than I expected it to. Um, it was my older one was like 18 months and she was in the bathtub and we were washing her hair and she was taking her curls and pulling them straight and then like pasting them against her cheek and saying, look, I have long hair. I have long hair. And I like froze. And to yeah. the point of, of language and what we both present as parents that may look different than our kids or the language that we may be accustomed to using, they, they pick that stuff up, right? I mean, you mentioned the importance of emphasizing identity around hair and part of the reason, and there's sort of two sides to that. One is we want it to be celebrated in something positive and it's about celebrating differences, but also knowing that it's the basis on which they are othered, right? And they are taught that or told by society that their differences are, are less than. And so, you know, really uh, understanding that you have to allow your child to develop their own personal identity and encouraging that and, and also understanding that it's you know it, it may literally look different than you than your own right as is the case um for both of us but um it was a a, a moment of me then you know I, she was only 18 months old as I said trying to go back and think where the hell did she hear that right like Moana by the way I mean like Moana is it was on repeat in our home and what I yeah. love about it is Moana right. has, you know, thick curly hair that we yep. weren't really into dolls, but that was the first doll we got because yep. she had very similar hair texture. But, you mm -hmm. know, I realized that in casual conversation with my mom or around the house, I may have said things like, oh, God, my hair's so long, or I got to blow dry my hair straight, or, you know, I got to get a haircut because it's long. And she clearly picked that up, right? And mm -hmm. it was just this immediate, like, oh, shit, I have to be much more careful around these you know, things that you don't even think about until those moments happen, right? And, yeah. and really shifting towards 
um, you know, as you said, really celebrating her particular curly hair. And the thing that's interesting is my girls have um, two very different hair textures between the two yeah. of them, right? Yeah. So that also is going to be a whole different, you know, sort of yeah. journey. So um, to you just, you know, being a parent now and, and thinking yeah. even more intentionally about how we raise the next generation and, and do all we can in our homes to, you know, prepare them for the real world in which, yes, there are things like the Crown Act and, you know, other ways in which we made progress, but ultimately it is about celebrating identity and encouraging that and um, creating as much positivity as you possibly can in hopes that they'll have that armor and confidence, you know, when they go out into the real world. And I think that the good news is, is that actually works. So right. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So like a lot of the research that went into the Crown Act was this implicit bias uh, testing. And the one subgroup that actually had a positive bias toward naturally textured hair were women in the natural hair community who make it a habit and spend right. time celebrating their hair. So I think, you know, if we teach ourselves as part of reclaiming our hair story, we're very intentional about affirming ourselves and celebrating our crowns. And we do that with our children, we are going to actually move the needle. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So I it's think, the like, point of, I've always thought these, you know, I've not been good at like, I don't know, self care and like meditation and what all these like, just, you know, like the mindful, I've always found it to be sort of like, okay, but who really can do that? And yeah. it's true. I, I, you make such a good point and it's that, um, it, it truly is a mindset and a practice. And uh, on that, you know, note, same thing with being coming a parent and actually getting to put it into practice has made me really appreciate, as you said, how much it really um, matters and, and, and changes, right, things yep. around our own personal perception. Um, and, but you have to wake up every day with those affirmations and have a real, you know, purpose and commitment around it. And that's so fascinating that, and no surprise, right, that people who do this work every day and who wake up every day committed to celebrating natural hair have a unconscious natural, uh, you know, bias toward a positive bias towards textured hair. Yeah, exactly. And I think so that's another thing I try to do. And uh, within our Sienna Naturals community is like, celebrate the time that you spend on your hair, because it is a part of self care. The more time you spend caring for it, taking care of it, the more positive you're going to feel about it and about yourself. And that's going to shine through and that's going to have this ripple effect gradually. I would also say like for kids, as it relates to kids, again, the hairstyles of your youth give you the scalp of your adulthood, right? So like, especially with textured hair and yeah. wanting to pull the hair or put the extensions in, like, I think it's so important. And I really try with my daughter not to feed into this. Like I want it longer. I want it. this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, let's celebrate the fact that it grows up to the sky like a flower mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you have this volume like you can't okay sorry create. sorry we're writing this kid's book hana that's okay we're writing that's another line book the right now i love it i'm down <laughs> um but you know the thing is is that you have to um you have to i think it's really important especially for the kids to be embracing the natural hair because that will keep mm -hmm. their follicles healthy right and right alopecia, alopecia from styling practices is the number one cause of hair loss in black women. Mm. Um, and you know, I mean, you, you just, when you start to look into and start to research like wh why, this, why this day exists and why this le legislation has been passed, you just find like at every turn, you know, there has been um, discrimination. There has been these, you know, policies, even within like the US Army, for example, there were policies that required oh, yeah. black women to wear their hair in very specific ways that are mm -hmm. extremely limiting. And mm -hmm. oftentimes would require you to use like even a chemical on your hair. Um, right. And so I think, you know, we, we have to, we have to have this health focus to it. Um, and having that health focus and creating these norms and these practices of self celebration and self love are they're going to have the ripple effect that will change society. Yes, absolutely. Well, my goodness, on that note, uh, you are amazing. Thank you so much for collaborating with us on this occasion. We are so honored to be in partnership with Sienna Naturals. Um, do you want to do a little quick product plug or anything like that? Yes. Yeah. Sienna, do you have, I'm sure you have something right there for all of us to see. I always have yes, a product at my desk. I love here, it. Here, here's what's at my desk right now. So we'll talk about it. 
Talking about scalps, for example, um, we have our daily elixir hair and scalp oil. I have this bottle that's like almost gone. Um, but this is actually award winning. We just won the Cosmo award for um, a scalp Yay! oil. Congratulations. Thank you. And so what's really incredible about this is it's very soothing. It's made with copaiba resin, which is sustainably harvested from Brazil to really help soothe irritated scalp. I love to use it because I'm very active. I work out. I mean, when I say I'm very active, I mean, I do my 20 minutes a day. Okay. But like, <laughs> I'm like, and, I'm very active by, uh, I put on yoga pants in the morning and maybe I make it to uh, my Peloton, but yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I have to do that because I find like the stress, just getting the stress out of the body. That's my number one goal with exercise. I think yeah, the benefits same. for the mind are just worth it. So I put this on, clear the salt off of my scalp. And then this, this is our scalp clearing massager, but um, one of our customers nicknamed hers Leroy. And so I always call it Leroy. <laughs> and so you put the oil in and then you let it. Wait, Hannah, can you, I've actually, so I've gotten really into scalp oils during uh, the pandemic. You said that putting the oil on helps to get the salt out. So is it also like a cleansing uh, mechanism with the oil and like dirt and a residue bit in your hair? Clear. Yes, you're going to get some of the clearing and the cleansing benefit. And, and then just gently rubbing it in will also help break off anything that's starting to build up because right. what you don't want is build up on your scalp over a period of time that will start to clog your hair follicle. So yeah, you don't want anything it. building up on the scalp um, in between washes too much. So I love these two together. They are magic. Um, and by the way, we, I, this was very, very important to me. Uh, because a lot of the research with Sienna Naturals goes towards hair and scalp health, right? And mm -hmm. just understanding, like, so many of us are facing, facing alopecia from our from st styling habits as a consequence. Um, and I found that Black women tend to have more sensitive scalps. And a lot of it is probably from the products that we've been using in the years mm -hmm. of damage that happened. But in general, we have more sensitive scalps, which is, to me, another reason why you need a cleaner, safer product. Um, but we did just have all of our products dermatologists tested. So they're safe and awesome. they're prepared. And I, I've always used them on my kids. I mean, when they came out of the womb, they were using my products. Um, and because so they're all perfect. natural, right? And super... they're, they're super, they're very clean. They're all natural. But um, not only are they all natural, but they're also safe. So like, mm -hmm. I think the dermatologist tested actually is really important because you are then running this clinical study to prove that it's safe for sensitive skin because even if something comes from the earth it can it can cause a sensitivity it doesn't always it's not always right. safety interesting interesting well thank you i'm out to, i'm gonna get this scalp oil i've, I've truly become obsessed with it during in part because i badly need a haircut and so i've just been braiding my hair and you know we're beautiful. part indian so we the coconut oil is a big thing uh just like yes. slathering yes. it in there all over yeah. the scalp so it's There's kind of similar oil in here. amazing mm -hmm. amazing well thank you again hana i'm so grateful for your partnership and friendship and yes, i've learned well. so much from you just in this conversation alone so i really appreciate you taking the time and i hope everyone enjoyed the conversation uh we will continue the conversation this is the first conversation of four i believe that we are doing throughout the month of July. So Crown Day is uh, on July 3rd, but we are celebrating all month long and hope that you all come back and join us for more. So thank you everyone for joining and Hannah, thank you so much to you. Thank you so much, Mina. Thanks, Phenomenal. <laughs> Thanks, Phenomenal. All right. Thanks, Phenomenal. <laughs> Bye, Thanks, everyone. Mina. See you later. Bye.